As a seminary, the Azusa Pacific University uh, School of Theology, now seminary, has offered this Malcolm Robertson lectureship on holy living for now 33 years. This is the 33rd lectureship that we have offered in keeping with our commitment to preparing one another, challenging one another toward holiness and holy living. And over the years, we've had a variety of speakers and a variety of topics, uh, but it's always been a highlight of our year, in my opinion, as we remind ourselves why we're here, why God has called us into this relationship. I cannot resist introducing Dr. John Hartley. He will be embarrassed, but Dr. John Hartley is a retired uh, school of theology seminary professor. How many years, Dr. Hartley, did you teach here at APU? A guessing? You want us to guess? 47? 47? Oh, how many, Dorothy? 47. You got it. 47 years. 47 years. And I, this, is, this is all about me now. He was my first professor, shaped the way I studied scripture. And yeah, it's my fault. It's his fault. We're honored that, we're honored that you're here, both Dorothy and John. Thank you for coming this evening. Our lecturer this evening, Dr. Mary Kate Morris, I said in the afternoon session, I, it, this, is, was, this was a selfish invitation. I invited her selfishly because she has impacted my, my life, my view of myself. Her book on leadership, both of her books are, are available in the back. Her book on leadership really challenged me and transformed the way I think about my, my power and my presence when I'm in relational settings, the way I conduct my conversation, my interaction with people in a meeting, in a classroom, or even just a, uh, an informal social setting. And so um, I, I know that she's going to mention, she's going to talk about some of those things this evening. She is a professor of leadership and spiritual formation at the seminary, Portland Seminary, uh, which is a part of George Fox University. She's a mentor to the doctoral students there, to a group of doctoral students at the seminary. She has uh, spent years serving in the Andes Mountains of Bolivia and Peru. She has planted two churches. She is a pastor and a scholar. Uh, so would you, I'm going to pray first and then I'm going to invite you to welcome. Would you join me in prayer before I introduce Dr. Mary Kate Morris? Let's pray. Our Savior, our Lord, our Teacher, we gather in this room as your disciples, as your students, your learners, to sit at your feet. We invite you to teach us through this instrument, this vessel of grace, Mary Kate Morris. We thank you for her life. We thank you for her um, her heart, and her mind. We thank you for the way that she demonstrates the principles of the kingdom of God that we'll be discussing this evening. We pray that you would open our hearts and our minds and our lives to the message that you've laid on her heart. May we be different because of this time that we spend here. We love you. We thank you that you love us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you welcome Dr. Mary-Kate Morse? Well, thank you very much. And how wonderful that you've come out in the evening uh, around dinner time in the dark to see me. I'm very grateful. 
looking forward to our time together. We had a really great time this morning, and uh, this afternoon, I mean, and so I'm looking forward to the conversation uh, this evening. And uh, Dr. Hartley, I just want to salute you for faithful service for 47 years. I'm proud of my 30, but I guess I'm just a, a kid, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you for being here. I'm honored. Yeah. Um, this morning, um, I spoke about holiness as living every day as Christ's embodied presence. So I tried to make the case that we carry in our bodies the message of holy living, that it's not something we construct with our thoughts that we figured out, and so, or it's not something that we construct with our actions in particular, like we do certain things or don't do certain things, but it's the experience people have of us as the presence, as representing the presence of Christ that says more about our holiness than anything else. So what I want to do tonight is unpack that a little bit, make it practical, break it down, tell you what it looks like, and then how do you steward that well? Uh, and how do you avoid using it poorly? So um, I, star I started in the morning by making the point that God is holy, I made the point, which I think we all agree, I made the point that we are made in the image of God, so we are to reflect the holiness of God. It was part of the design. Uh, we were created to be in relationship with each other, to connect and to have responsibilities, to have dominion over the earth and the creatures. But what happened in the fall is we desired to be as God. There was that little phrase that that they desired to be as God. They wanted to know the difference between good and evil. So that perfect alignment of partnership and, 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 and camaraderie was broken so that then we created this shift where power became something about being over rather than being together. And what Jesus' death and resurrection did was restore the possibility for the original design of God. So this is not a fairy tale talk. This is a talk about how we actually, every day, in and out, from morning to night, might live a holy life. How we might do that. So holy living, therefore, is living as the embodiment of Christ's character and mission, but the lens that I want to use to do that, to sort of what does that look like for embodied power, is to look at the idea of power. Because this was the disruption, the original disruption, was trying to be power over. Uh, before I start, um, I want to tell you some stories. So, and I was in a conversation last week with a young, a young leader, she, she's in France, and she had intend, attended an international church planting uh, conference, and there were 160 persons in attendance, and six of them were women, and she was one of them. She thought that this was uh, a bit of a difficulty because you know half the church is female, or sometimes a little bit more, and so perhaps we could evangelize faster if we had more women involved. So she went to the... Um, organizer and, and asked if she could, um, if this could become a concern for the group. It just so happened that she was also on the board of this organization that sponsored these conferences. She was the only woman on the board. So what the uh, chair said is, well, we're, we're meeting in a month. If you would come and I'll give you 15 minutes on the agenda and you can present your perspective on why this matters, and what we might do about it, okay? So she's a young leader, uh, so she was um, excited for the opportunity, but she also knew that several people on the board did not agree that women should be in those kinds of positions, like an evangelist. And so she very prayerfully and very carefully thought about what she was gonna say, and she worked on it diligently for hours. She had people that uh, knew her pray for her. Uh, and uh, so she had, she had set this up. She wanted to have the right heart and the right spirit when she went to this meeting. 
So she went to the meeting. She was nervous. She was energized. She had a little group of people praying for her back uh, in her town in France. And uh, when she got there, she noticed that she wasn't on the agenda. So she thought, well, maybe it will come up. Uh, but then they started going through the meeting. And about halfway through the meeting, uh, she says, well, I'm going to bring it up. So she asked the chair if, you know, that she had been come prepared to do this presentation. And the chair, um, the, the, before the chair could answer, another man interrupted and said, we don't have time for this. And let's just do better next time and try to move on. Well, she was disappointed. And um, the chair noticed that she was disappointed. So the chair said, well, go ahead. Take a few minutes. Just you know, take a couple of minutes and make your point. So she tried to make her point. But she had only a couple minutes. She had prepared herself to do this in a certain way. And she was, she was devastated that she had been dismissed like that. Now, this is a very small thing, a meeting. But in that meeting, the people that were in control of the meeting uh, had not given her the place that she had been promised. So that's one story. Another story is about a man I'm going to call John. And John had worked for 14 years in a very large church uh, in a, in, as the junior high minister. And it was a really successful, very specialized ministry that he had developed for 14 years. He came to church one day, and he found out that they had moved his entire department to the basement of the church. And they had put him under the head of uh, the high school minister. Nobody had talked to him. Nobody had said anything to him about this. So in both of these situations, these were people that had been not had been consulted, not had been had not been brought into the conversation, had not been given the dignity of having a perspective and a voice. So even though they might seem like little organizational matters, I suggest that something was going sideways in the way that they were embodying the power of Christ, in the way that they were re representing the kingdom of God. Another story. Jill works in student services on a university. And one day, two parents came in yelling and screaming at her in her office. She was in student services. And they were just out of control, yelling and screaming. Um, Jill is black. The parents were white. The parents um, were upset because there was a Martin Luther King Jr. poster up for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And this isn't the character of this particular university, but um, these parents were out of control. And they had showed up in another department on campus, but because uh, they didn't know what to do with them, they sent them over to Jill because she was black and she could handle it. <laughs> another incident, not so small, but still making choices that put some people in a very difficult position. So all of these stories, I think, represent the abuse of power. And I want to talk about holy living as observed in the right use of power. I believe that if we manage our power for good and not for evil or not to preserve ourselves, we are living as Jesus called us to live. So power used well creates hospitable spaces where people feel welcome. And power used poorly creates consumer spaces. And Jesus is going to be our model. So are you ready to go? So that was kind of little backdrop stories trying to um, prick your interest. So I want to talk about first some premises. And how do we live like Jesus? How do we use power and, rather than power with, rather than power over? How do we internalize what it looks like to be in that original design as much as possible, despite our frailties and brokenness and all that sort of thing? How do we go back to that place? So I want to talk about several premises. And the first one is that Jesus himself embodied servant leadership. Jesus came in the flesh. 
He didn't come uh, uh, as a myth or as a, a, some other kind of a figure. He came in the flesh. And Jesus was both a leader. He, he preached. He taught. He engaged uh, the, the religious leaders of the time. But Jesus also washed feet. Uh, he also uh, told parables about the Good Samaritan. So he was able to put these two things together. So when you think of a servant, you don't think of, you think of someone with no power, right? And when you think of a leader, you think of someone with power. Jesus put them together. And I think that's hard for us to understand. So we think if we're just a leader and we're just nice to people, we're a servant leader. Or if we pick up the trash or something, we're a servant leader. It's much more systemic than that. Or if we're a servant, then sometimes we give up times when we should be saying something and leading and being involved. Jesus put it together. And so Jesus is our model for this. This point I've already talked about, that we are created in the image of God, which means then that we can model, we can follow Jesus as our model. In our flesh, we can figure out how to put these two things together and live a holy life. The third premise is that there's no separation of mind and body. We don't have bodies. We are bodies. We don't have bodies. We are bodies. The adaptive unconscious is a term used to talk about how the body is constantly seeking for security and for meaning. It's constantly looking for safety and significance. Every time a, you come into a room, that's part of, what, of the stuff that's on your agenda. Do I fit here? Am I safe here? Do I matter here? So this is an embodied experience, not a decision-making experience. So what happens is then when you walk into a room, there's a social narrative that happens. People make snap judgments about a person's worth, their competence, aggressiveness, and likability within the first tenth of a second. And people rarely revise their first impressions. Let me tell you, uh, give you some, uh, some research that shows how this works. This is a piano competition, a classical piano competition. And uh, there is a researcher named Chia Jung Tse, who is both a classical pianist and a social psychologist. And she did an experiment with trying to understand how it is that people chose the winner of a piano competition. Now, this will all make sense in a minute. So what she did is she divided a group. She divided people into three groups. And these people all were musicians. So they understood music. They, they were either professional musicians or they were amateur, but they understood music. So she divided them into three groups. She showed them, uh, they were, they were they, their job was to pick the winner of a piano competition. That was their job. So one group got to watch a tape of the competition with them playing and with the sound. So they watched the full performance on a tape. Another group just heard the sound. Another group just saw the tape, no sound. So which one of those groups most accurately predicted the winner? The tape with no sound. The tape with no sound. Now this should shake you. It shook me a little bit because it, it, you realize how powerfully we use our senses to determine a person's worth and competency and value, much more than we realize that we use our senses to make these decisions. Um, and that was published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Science. So this is another one. 
Uh, two researchers, Benjamin and Shapiro, published in the National Bureau of Economic Research, they did the same kind of a, an experiment, except they looked at debates for a governor position. And they divided people into three, group, three groups again. These people did not know the candidates. And one of the groups got to see the, the debate and hear the debate. Another group just heard the debate. And a third group just saw the debate. And the same thing happened. The group that just saw the debate and heard nothing most accurately predicted the winner. Most accurately predicted winner. So next election, just turn the sound down. <laughs> You'll be good to go. So I'm, I'm trying to impress on you. This is such a part of our embodied nature that we don't even think about it. We don't even think about it. But we do this all the time. We make snap decisions. And these snap decisions come out of the world's broken understanding of who has value. These snap decisions do not come out of the heart of Christ. This is not how Jesus Christ sees you. It is not how the Holy Spirit picks who he cares about. The Holy Spirit cares about all of us. God watches over all of us. But the world will say that some people have more worth than others, that some people have more competence than others. And those are the people that are given the power, and the others are not. This is the brokenness of our humanity because of the fall. So let me talk a little bit then about, um, let me talk a little bit about uh, when we think of leaders. Because I want to make this point. When we think of leaders, uh, we often think of, you know, up front, you know, speaking, strategic planning, uh, leading, managing, a vision casting, all this sort of thing. It's true, leaders do that. But I want to suggest that leadership is more than what leaders do. And this matters because so many of you are preparing for the ministry or are in the ministry. So I want you to put this in a leadership bucket too, not just in a general population bucket. Leadership is more physical than mental. Leadership is more physical than mental. How people experiences you, how people experience you, how they feel about you when they're with you, that makes a difference in how they trust you and will follow you. Now, in some environments where you don't have a choice, of course, that doesn't matter. But in our country, in our day, in our time, we have choices. And we make decisions to follow, follow people uh, based on how our experience is of them. So I want to suggest that your leadership is an embodied experience of Christ. It's more relational than getting things done. It's more in Christ than about Christ. You can know all things about the Bible and theology, all things in your head and in, in the libraries about Jesus. You, you can be the most amazing scholar on the planet, but if you don't have Jesus living inside of you, known and clear to you, then it's just words. It's not a life. Be the life of Jesus, not just the words of Jesus, even though words matter. So I want to say that. So leadership is actually then this relationship process in Christ for Christ's intended transformation purposes. So it's a relationship process. The other point I want to make, so we're breaking down servant leadership, because that's what Jesus was. The other point I want to make is that when we think of serving, we often think of it as uh, you know helping out. Helping out, going, doing something good for people, a soup, you know, a soup kitchen or picking up trash or, or building a, a, a place. And all of that is really good. But it's much more than that. Serving is getting to good. 
not just doing good. Serving is getting to good, not just doing good. Man, if we were in a classroom, we would be so talking this whole lecture, back and forth, back and forth. What does that mean to you, getting to good? See, I can't help it. When you get to good, you have to talk with, the, with each other. You can't just say, oh, they need this, and go do it. Getting to good is giving others the dignity and the value of having their voice and perspective paid attention to. And again, this is an embodied experience. So when we think of, of power, this is what we're going to really focus on now. So I gave you a little free stuff because you're in seminary. <laughs> we have a love-hate relationship with power. Now, some of you that were here this morning uh, heard some of this, and I'm gonna, but I'm going to be breaking it down even further. We have a love-hate relationship with power, but power is essential for life and significance. If you are powerless, then you will either draw into yourself. I think a lot of depression and uh, these sorts of things are caused by just the feelings of powerlessness that people have over their life. Or you will act out, one or the other. Rollo May did a lot of research around this, uh, this understanding of power and innocence. Power is also morally neutral. It can be used uh, for good or for evil. And uh, power is simply the ability to cause or prevent change. We were designed to have it. It was put in our bodies to have it. Um, so the other interesting thing about it is that it's interpersonal and emotional. We constitute it with each other. It's not something that you get in a package. It doesn't come in a box. Like, here's power. Go for it. We give it to each other. This is very important. Because when you walk into a room, we make a decision about a person's worth and competence. And when you walk into a room, the group will automatically constitute who has more power than others, again, from a world's perspective. They will automatically do that. So it's socially constructed body to bodies. Uh, we read bodies. We look at these guys. Not too friendly, maybe a little arrogant. We look at these people. Do you see the difference? Just warm, open. Would you like to talk with these people? Yes, you would. So what I would like to do is um, tell you a story of Jesus in using his power, and then I want to break it down. This story is found in Luke, the seventh chapter, verses 36 through 50. This is the story of the sinner woman in Simon's house. And what we're, when we look at the story, we are just going to be looking at particularly focusing on the bodies and the bodied experience. We have Simon, who invited Jesus in, and other Pharisees. We have Jesus. We have the sinner woman. And we also have a crowd. So one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner was also there. So that's the first two verses. So Jesus was invited to have dinner with the Pharisees. Uh, so this is uh, usually they're called a haburim club. They would get together and they would discuss the law. And they, a guest rabbi in town, they'd bring him in. They'd sit around together at the table and discuss things going on. Um, and so Jesus was invited in as a guest. Social occasions in this environment were open to the public. It's not like our Social occasions, if we invite someone to our house, no one comes in but who we invited. In these occasions, the house is open, and people can come in and sit around the edges of the house, of the room, and watch the conversation. And then Jesus and the other rabbis and the Pharisees there would be having uh, dinner and talking, and when they're finished, everyone else would be fed. That's how it worked. 
That's why the woman was in the room. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been possible for a sinner woman to go into a Pharisee's home. But she was in the room because she had learned that Jesus was eating in a Pharisee's house, and she had brought an alabaster jar of ointment. So she came into the room prepared to anoint Jesus during the rituals, the opening rituals of the dinner. She came in, and she was... And in the story, she stood behind him at his feet. So that's kind of an repre artistic representation. She was weeping, and she began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. So she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the ointment. This would have been a shocking display going on in a Pharisee's house at a you know, haburim dinner, to have a woman being hysterical at the feet of Jesus, crying, taking her hair down in public, a uh, no-no, and touching him, touching him. Just everything about it would have been shocking. The whole party would have stopped, and everybody would have been paying attention to this and wondering what is going on. This is completely... Out of, out of control. Um, and so Jesus just doesn't do anything. Jesus doesn't do anything. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, which means he kind of aside, said out loud, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And the construction is used to suggest that he's already made a decision that he's not a prophet. Jesus is not a prophet. We don't even have to talk. It's over. No debate. The woman is touching him. He's not saying or doing anything. He should be pushing her away. He doesn't. So Simon says, OK, not a prophet. Check. We're done with that. And the word that he uses for touching him is the same word of for fondling. It's like a sexual word. So he was, uh, he, was, he was disgusted, in a sense, about what was going on and in his house to Jesus. And Jesus then spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Now, this is the first time that Jesus speaks in this story that we have recorded. So all this other stuff, nothing has been said. And he said, sure, go ahead, teacher. Speak. And then he tells the parable about the two debtors. But I want to skip that. And, and Jesus says, which of them will love him more? And Simon said, the one who canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then, this is, then he turns to the woman. This is the first time that he pays attention to the woman. She's been all the time sobbing, crying. You can imagine snot coming out of her nose. I mean, she's just, she's just overcome with emotion. And he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? Those of you that were here this morning, Jesus saw the woman that was bent over. In this story, she is obviously, everybody sees this woman, but nobody sees this woman. What they see is something that offends them. They are disgusted and offended. And the crowd is shocked and curious, but nobody sees the woman. Jesus saw the woman. Jesus said, do you see this woman? I entered your house. I can just imagine the tone of voice Jesus had at that point. I entered your house. Hospitality is an indication of one's character. So the quality of hospitality indicates the amount of, of honor you have as a holy person. So Simon should have been showing off his holiness.
but we shall see that he did not. It was too confusing. He said, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. Now, when you walk into a home at this time, there are rituals that happen at the door as you enter, as you come into the home, certain things that you do to express hospitality. The first thing you do is you have a bowl of water so that your guests can wash their feet. That's the first thing you do. So if, if um, you want to honor the guest, the host will wash the guest's feet. If you want to treat the guests like a peer, you give the guest uh, 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 the bowl of water. If you, if you want to uh, honor him as, as somebody special, you'd have a servant, perhaps, washing his feet. But, he, but Simon did not even give Jesus a bowl of water. You can imagine every Pharisee at that table had had their feet washed. So when Jesus walked into that house, he was dissed. He was ignored. It's as if you would come to my house, and I invited you to dinner, and you came to the door, you knocked, I went to the door, opened the door, and said, oh, it's you. And I turned and walked away. <laughs> what would you feel? A little embarrassed, confused, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? But Jesus walked in anyway. He loved Simon. You gave me no water for my feet. So she has been bathing my feet with her tears. So this is what I want to suggest, that the woman, actually, who had no power at all, nothing, no power at all, she was so offended at what Simon had done to Jesus, that she was making up for his lack. She was making up for his lack. She had no water, but she, she had her tears. So I don't think they were just tears of emotion because she was glad. I'm sure that was part of it. I think she was angry that this beautiful, amazing man who had said something somewhere to give her hope was being treated like this inside a Pharisee's house. So she was using her tears to wash his feet and then and dry them with her hair. She had no towels, so she takes her hair down. This is the most sexual part of a woman in the Middle East. You do not show your hair. And so for her to take it down in public, she did not care. She was going to do the right thing, no matter what it looked like for her. So she is drying his feet, her, his feet with her hair. He also said, Simon, you gave me no kiss. You gave me no kiss, which is also the second ritual. They wash the feet. Then you kiss the cheek if it's a peer. You, you kiss the hand to show respect. You kiss the feet after you wash them if you really want to say, this is my Lord. Simon couldn't figure it out. He, didn't, he had his buddies around the table. Well, I don't want to kiss him on the cheek because he's not my peer. I'm certainly not going to kiss him on the feet, and I'm not going to kiss his hand. I just won't kiss him. Everybody saw this. She saw, everybody's around. They saw how Jesus was treated when he walked into that room. But that woman, she's kissing his feet, showing her great love for this amazing man. And then she said, you did not anoint my head with oil, so, which is the last part of the ritual, was anointing. And again, the same thing, whether you give him the oil or you do it yourself or whatever. But she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. So if we look at this just from, this is just a little dinner. It's preserved in scripture. It's preserved in scripture, I think, not only to 
teach us something about how Jesus handles hostile environments, but also to remember this woman. This sinner woman who had no power, used her body, used what she had to make up for Simon's offense. For Simon's offense. And Simon, who had all the power, male, religious leader, wealthy, he had all the power. He couldn't bend himself enough to even do the basics to show goodness and kindness in the house. Jesus stayed because he still cared about Simon. So we could talk a long time. We could unpack what this means about how we embody holy living. What do we do when we have no power? We do the right thing. We do the right thing. We don't just say, well, I don't have any power, so I can't, what can I do? You know, somebody else should be doing something. You do the right thing. And it also shows us that just when we don't do the right thing, that Jesus still loves us, still loves us. And we also see in this story the tendency that when you are given a lot of power by your social system, then it's hard to let go. You want to keep it. You don't want to tarnish it. You don't want to diminish it. Jesus was willing to go to the cross to give up his power for us. So certainly, Simon could have given up a little self-respect to show kindness to a guest in his home. But he didn't. He didn't. So I just, um, I want to take a little bit of time here because I, I spent so, I, I love that story. And um, I want to talk a little bit about what the world does with power. We, we give it to each other uh, or we take it away. So we're going to play a little game. Okay, I brought dynamite. <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> um, uh, dynamite uh, is from the Greek word dunamis, which means to be able to, and it's often translated as power. So God gave us the ability, every single person, when we were created in the image of God, were given the ability, you're given power. We're given power. So I'm going to give this out to some people. So who would, who would like some power? So this is what the world does. It has markers. Oh, and it doesn't have much of a fuse either. Uh, very quick. You are very quick. The world has its t subverted way, twisted way of deciding who is more important, who has more power than other people. And the first thing that they look at is gender. So males usually get more power than females. Just automatically. So, sorry. no, just sit, yeah, just stay there. No, no, I, I'm taken. Oh, you're you're taken. not giving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Don't go away. Don't go away. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. So, in some environments, it doesn't do that. So we're so the first thing is gender. The second thing is age. <laughs> Older men and younger women. <laughs> Don't you feel bad? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. No, no. The next thing is ethnicity. So for if you're in a dominant culture, like, like this, is a, this, tends, this country is basically a white country, right? 
And so in environments, usually the white person has more privilege. But which, whichever environment you're in, uh, whichever is the dominant culture, the non-dominant one is less trusted in that environment. So. Gotta get mine up. <laughs> I, just, I just want you to see what is happening. What we do. We do this in social settings. We do this. So I'll take one away. The other is emotion. So people that are uh, open and warm and happy, uh, they, they get more. <laughs> Culture. So uh, we're in an educational institution. So a person with uh, more education would have more power, right? Yeah, they do. So you can keep, <laughs> you can keep yours. Uh, and then uh, your economic level. So if you are, uh, you know, if you come from, okay, let me start with. You can tell when someone walks into a room whether they have money or not, right? And don't they usually get paid attention to? And are they often the ones that get in positions of influence because they have money? And they get to make decisions? Now, it's, I mean, it's true. They have wisdom and all that sort of stuff. But we default. We don't take into consideration. We don't take into consideration their, oftentimes their character. But we default. The world will take from who's ever, and you feel it. When you walk into a room, you feel it. Do you feel it, honey, at the end? I, I feel a lot of things. OK. <laughs> I love it. But when you walk into a room, uh, you can tell when you enter it whether you are being, whether people are taking you seriously or not, or notice you or not, or are afraid of you or not. Uh, uh, or suspicious, or, or what? I mean, you, you feel it in your body. And when we, when we do that to each other, when we ignore or overlook someone for any of those reasons, we are using our power poorly. So, if you have a lot of power, what do you think your job is? If the world has given you a lot, what is your responsibility? You got it, guy. <laughs> what are we afraid of when to do this? What are we afraid we're going to lose if we share power? Control, there's the word. We are afraid we're going to lose control. Who's in control? God is in control. Who is the most powerful person or thing in the universe? God. We don't have to defend God. We can be holy and righteous. We can be clear about our beliefs. I think that's important to know what you believe, to be clear about it and thoughtful about it. But you don't have to protect God because what you're really protecting is yourself. You don't, unconsciously or consciously, you don't want to give up the benefit of being in that privileged place, being in that privileged place. But what what can happen, and this is what Jesus did. Why did Jesus, you know, why did he bother with that woman? Why didn't he just pat her on the head and say, honey, it'll be okay, I can handle this? He could have just said, yeah, it's, I got this under control, don't worry. I know he's a terrible man, but just settle down. 
he let her have a voice. Even though she didn't say a word, she had a voice. He gave her the, dig the dignity. He gave her the dignity of having a voice. So you can collect. Thank you. Don't let go of your power. Because nobody can take that away from you. Don't let go of it. And if the world, if you're in a kind of an environment where they're saying you shouldn't have it, don't believe it. Don't believe it. Let the Holy Spirit lead you and develop you and help you discover your own competencies and goodness and all that sort of thing. So, I, I don't want to wear you out. Um, when Jesus, um, Jesus went about doing good, he saw people. He talked to people that nobody else bothered with. And part of our responsibility to live holy lives is to have that same generous, hospitable, open approach to people that God brings along our paths. That same generous, I have the time for you, or I want to hear what you have to say, to take away, like those first stories, to take away the dignity of that person, that, that young French woman, her ability to, to, to share what she needed to share by just dismissing it, that was an abuse of power. By telling that faithful servant who had been leading for 14 years that he was being downsized without him even being a part of the conversation, that's using power poorly. By imagining that you know what someone's going to feel or think or do because of their color, that's a horrible abuse of power. So when we think about it for ourselves, I would like to give you an imagination for seeing yourself as a banquet table of a living God and not as someone who has to protect and hold on to what lots or little they perceive they might have. Because God gave you everything that you need to live a full, productive, mission-centered life. And the world can't take that away from you. So amen. So thank you for uh, your talk. As I mentioned at lunch, thank you for making me feel short. <laughs> what are you going to do, rub my head next? <laughs> no, please don't. Um, so um, as I mentioned at lunch, there are several of us actually in this room that are uh, working on a project having to do with lament. And um, a, a thought occurred to me, a question occurred to me, and I think I know what you're going to say, but let me ask it anyway. Does rushing to being okay in times of sadness, sorrow, uh, grief, does rushing to being okay uh, reflect a way of stripping someone or ourselves yeah. of power yeah. to be sad or right. so forth? I, so. Right. Uh, of course. Yeah, when you uh, disrupt the emotional experience of someone by patronizing them with it's going to be okay or something, uh, it, it, it's, it's hard. I, I, I don't recommend it. <laughs> um, I think people need to feel fully their emotions. And like when Jesus was allowing this woman to be angry, uh, to express her feelings and not try to cut it short. Um, there's so much, you, I've, we've just scratched the surface. There's so much to think about and talk about in regards to this around how we use our minds, how we use our bodies, how we use our emotions, 
how do, how do we create a place of dignity and worth so that we can even tell our stories? It is, it's, okay, I'm tired. But things like Me Too and Black Lives Matter, when those conversations get shut down because someone decides it's, it's too messy or I don't agree or it's just some hysterical women or some out of control people, it's, it's completely, um, I think, dishonoring to those individuals' experience. They have to be able to say, this is my experience, whether you agree with it or not, it's as real as your experience of thinking differently and probably more so real. And I believe if we could uh, uh, have this feeling of hospitality rather than trying to control each other, but trust what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives, we could have these profound conversations where things that are kept in the dark, the real things that are kept in the dark are brought out into the light, are brought out into the light. If you have, excuse me, brothers and sisters, but if you have people of color telling you that black lives matter, then you need to just sit across from them and say, tell me all about it. Tell me all about it. And not just say, dismiss it. The same thing with women's experiences. Mary Kay, I brought my intro to Christian ministry class. So they're mostly sophomore undergrads oh. starting this discernment journey into ministry. Okay. And I think about how early on, we be it an internship, a volunteer position, you're one of your first paid jobs in a church, because of age, because of experience, you might feel so very disempowered in that space. Yeah. What advice would you give them about how to navigate that well, how to have a sense of that power that comes from God, with a balance of a sense of working with an institution and being respectful and being teachable as well? It's a great question. Uh, you know, the, what I'm talking about is messy. Um, and it, it takes a lot of courage and uh, thoughtfulness to know how to navigate some of the situations in which we find ourselves, especially if you're trying to figure it out uh, in, in a new environment, it's really difficult. Um, I, I unpack it more in my book, so I'm not, you know, I'm just saying, I, I, I'll try, I'll do a little bit right here. But the first place to start is to make sure that you are creating enough space for you and God to connect, that you have a robust spiritual life, and I don't mean just doing, taking off your devotions, like I prayed, read my Bible, you know, that sort of thing. I mean really just trying to be with Jesus, spending time with Jesus, talking to Jesus about whatever it is. You have to go in for uh, your first day on the job. Jesus, I'm nervous. I don't know what to do. You know, uh, last time I was there, they didn't hardly pay any attention to me. And and so you you have these conversations where you're able to be with God and you're able to connect with God because that's the first place. When you have God with you, then it's a lot easier to go in and handle the confusion of these environments where you're not always treated well. Um, I, that, that's a start, is, is to do that. And the second is to believe that... that uh, you, you do have a call, you do have something to contribute, and, and to not just give that up, but try to discover where you fit and where you thrive. Where you can be yourself. Where you can be yourself. Hi, um, this is from Living My Life, and I observe that people hold on to power, yeah. oftentimes because they feel insecure about their worth. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, would you agree with me that that's the reason why people hold on to power? It, and if so, how do I have this self-assurance in my self-worth? And, you know, how do I get that? How do mm -hmm. I, where is it, where does it come from? Mm -hmm. Would you please share a little bit about that? I, do, I believe that is one reason, is that people are insecure 
Um, I believe another reason is that they're arrogant sometimes. They just think they know better. And, and maybe they know a lot, uh, but that doesn't mean they know everything. I think another reason is sometimes just plain sin. Um, the way you make sure that you aren't, your insecurity isn't driving you to hold on to power is you make sure your security is rooted in Christ. And whenever you feel anxious, because I pay attention to my feelings, uh, because that's your indication of where you and the spirit are in a conversation. So if I'm feeling anxious, then I need to go to prayer and say, Lord, what's going on in me? Why am I anxious? And, and then I, I can learn about myself in prayer. I can figure out a little bit more about who I am. So I, I would recommend that you, when you notice that in yourself, that you uh, take it to prayer, conversation with God. Not just to get rid of it, get rid of it, but to ask the question, Lord, why am I feeling insecure? And I think the Holy Spirit will speak to you and let you know. One of the uh, grand verses of salvation is 2 Corinthians uh, 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. The verse prior to that, though, as, you, as we know, is so from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Mm. I don't know if this question is answerable, answerable or not, but in your opinion, why is it that we're in the 21st century? And we're still doing and it. And we still don't get this verse. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I think we still need Jesus. I think we still need Jesus. I don't think we, we, we need to wrestle with the uh, impact of our disobedience had on history, time, and our humanity. And every generation, every individual has to figure this out. And it's easy to, well, no, that's, it's, it's easy to, to, to do it in an easy way and not bother. People don't want to do the hard work of figuring it out. So my name is Rudy Reyes. I'm a second year in APU, and also I'm a, in the MATS program with an emphasis on theology and biblical studies. Mm -hmm. And so uh, thank you for, first You're off, just thank you for being here. Do you see what he just did? That's amazing. He, he said who he was, he, he said what he was doing, and that's what, what we all are invited to do, is to stand up and say who I am, what I'm doing, and he did that naturally. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, well, and the background for that is uh, I served 20 years in, in the military, and I was in the Navy for 20 years active oh, duty, yeah, no, and so uh, one of the things you hit on is leadership, which... I mean, it just lines up with my values and what I've learned yeah. and, and the leadership that they teach us being a, as we serve our country. Right. And some things you mentioned, uh, is, it was uh, when you think of leaders, you said it's more physical than mental, more relational, um, more about changing, maintaining, the serving, about, you know, um, getting to the good, not feeling the good. And also when you talked about the power. Yeah. Um, it's amazing stuff. because a lot of those core values, you know, we share in the military because, you know, we yes. have to find ways. And trust me, there's bad leadership in the military, mm -hmm. very bad leaders that I've dealt with in my 20 years. But I've also learned what not to do. But one thing I know you didn't talk too much about, which I think is kind of like something that we had to learn when I was serving was uh, motivation, you know, because each person's motivated differently by uh, something motivates everybody differently. You can't use the same thing for someone else because everybody is motivated by different things. Mm -hmm. So my question is, um, in regards to what we just spoke about, do you feel like finding the motivation within the people that you're mentoring, giving power to discipling, is that also important as well? Um, because I think if you find the motivation, you're going to find a drive behind a person to get them going mm -hmm. as far as fulfilling their kingdom's purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. There's a lot of elements to leadership. Uh, what I gave you uh, was some descriptors and a definition 
uh, and certainly being able to help people explore uh, and understand what motivates them is helpful in creating systemic change, for sure. It's a good point. <laughs> I just want to tell you thank you so much for uh, sharing your wisdom and insight. I was here this uh, afternoon, and I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed you. So that's not going to come natural for me to say that my name is Lynn Scott Ghosted, and I am a student at MDiv. But I'm also a um, lieutenant junior grade in the United States Navy Chaplain Canada as a program uh, oh, member. Fabulous. And so um, one of the things after two weeks of being around, so I would be, instead of having three strikes, um, being a triple threat, I have three strikes against me. Mm -hmm. I'm a young black woman in a male-dominated field. That's right. And I experienced a lot of this mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. And so um, my question that I would pose to you would be, in the story with the woman who decided to take an unspoken power that mm -hmm. she had to step forward mm -hmm. and wash his feet, mm -hmm. anoint him, mm -hmm. if in the instance that for today, Simon had have told her to get up and cease her action of what she was doing, knowing that she had within her the spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit to cause her to allow her to do that. How would you respond to that? If in today's environment, Simon had tried to disrupt it and get, get her out, um, well, how would I have responded to that or how would... Okay, let me go back to what I think you're talking about. You're in a military environment, so there are very particular procedures and rules for how things are done, when they're done, and who gets to say what, the line of authority, and it cannot be broken because it's a military environment and trying to discipline people so that they'll be ready to do whatever they need to do in an emergency. In that kind of environment, um, it... Uh, uh, when you see something that's not right um, and going wrong, um, then um, I think that you need to talk to a chaplain <laughs> or talk to uh, another officer uh, who can be involved. What would Jesus have done? I think Jesus would have told Simon to leave her alone in that environment. But this was, that was, a, that was kind of a, an in a family home environment. So I didn't know if that exactly answered your question or not. You can push on it a little bit. Your response being the woman being told. So in the position that I'm in, there is an unspoken power that I have as a chaplain to uh, do those things that you say. Yeah. But what I've come, come against are people who are under me who undermined uh, the authority that's been given. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. So then how then do you push back from that? I'm so sorry. Oh, no worries. Scott's got uh, it, right? No, it's okay. <laughs> but <laughs> thank you. But how then do you respond to that as the woman who was being told no, knowing that you have the power to do with So if people are undermining your authority that are under you, um, I, I would take a tough stand. Um, don't repeat me because I'm tired. Uh, but um, what I found, because when, when I was doing pastoring and church planning and stuff, sometimes I'd have something similar happen. But I would document the incident as much as possible, what, what happened, and then I would sit down with the person and just talk about the facts. I wouldn't try to talk about why they did it or what they did. I said, this is, this is what happened. This isn't going to happen this isn't how we do it in the military or whatever. Um, and I would do that. And I'm Rob, and I'm on the faculty in the seminary. So uh, you've, you talked about power as uh, it, you get power because people give it to you. It's socially and constructed, yeah. Socially constructed. And um, then in your exercise up here, um, I thought it was, you know, nice. It was, a, it was your point about if you have power, you need to redistribute it. Yeah. Um, but I have a question, and tell me if I'm just pushing the, the exercise, the, the analogy too far. Yeah. But we, you could take that exercise to say that um, communities of color don't have any power unless those in the dominant culture give it mm -hmm. to them. And I don't mm -hmm. think that's where you're, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm not, I'm guessing that's not what you do. Mm -hmm. but, but if we took that analogy, 
we could look at it that way. And I wonder how you could, if you might talk to that. How do, how do communities that have historically express, uh, uh, experienced oppression, uh, how do they get power? How is, isn't there some sort of power um, uh, incipient in them? Well, of course. Um, I didn't talk here about personal power. I just, um, like I did in the afternoon. Uh, so there's a difference between personal power and social power. Um, but what I tell you what I do. Um, oh, I, I read, uh, I make it a point to primarily read uh, people of color books. So I make it a point uh, to um, give my time in mentoring to people of color. Um, I make a point to give access to people of color because I'm in a, as, as a white woman in the academy, I have a little more privilege in the younger scholars and people coming up. What I, I can do things, so I, I don't give up my place in the sense that I'm still got a job and I'm teaching. And so there's a difference between power and authority too. So I don't give up my place, but I give access. And I, uh, because this has been denied for so many years, it has been so unfair, and uh, it's time now for that young generation of scholars, people of color, to have a bigger platform. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but. Let's thank Dr. Morse. One more. I, I think the thing um, I take away is that the kingdom of God is different than the world in which we live, and that we are always finding ourselves in settings with people, and the way the, way the world constructs relationships and power is pr always pressing against us. We, we, all, we all see it, we feel it if we're alert. And so what we are called to as Christ followers is to say, what, what, what do I do to change that so that it reflects the kingdom right. of God rather than the world's construction of power? And so that's a challenge. That's a challenge for us. I have to confess, I love this dynamite illustration. And I, the last time that I saw her do this, I was one of the guinea pigs. And, and at the end, I was holding all 12 sticks <laughs> of dynamite, which is very eye-opening in a helpful way. So let us pray, and then you are uh, free to go visit the book table, visit with Mary-Kate, although she's tired and she does have another appointment tonight. Um, or to go on out into the world and challenge the way the world views power. Let's pray. God of power who offered yourself willingly, offered your body willingly as a sacrifice on a cross to demonstrate to us how to respond, how to live. We worship you and we follow your example. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.